eternal Father in heaven, we want to thank you, dear Lord, that you have established your purpose and your will in bringing us in a place like this. Lord, I want to thank you for the opportunity to pray for your people. But Lord, I ask, dear Lord, that you may cleanse me of my sins and of my iniquities, dear Lord, as I lift up, dear Lord, your people, dear Lord, that you have brought together. I pray, Lord, for Jeff Hiffinger and his wife and his family. I pray for every family that is represented here today. I pray, Lord, as you have brought us all together, dear Lord, that, Lord, we will glean those things that you'd have us to glean as we go back to our respective homes, dear Lord. Help us, dear Lord, that we in turn, dear Lord, will pass on that which you have passed on to us, dear Lord. For, Lord, you have a purpose and you have a will for us. So, Lord, help us to accomplish that will and that purpose. I pray in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay. Um, now, before we get started on this presentation, uh, if I understand your, correctly, your question correctly, this is the latter rain that we're saying begins immediately after the Sunday Law, and we're saying that at the Sunday Law, God's people, modern Israel, have been purified uh, by the Sunday Law, and then here's the latter rain, and yet we're saying Pentecost is um, a symbol of the latter rain, parallel, um, prefigures it, and yet at Pentecost, um, what was going on there is there was a work for Israel itself going on. And for me, for, from what I've come to understand, that it, the lesson that is one of the primary lessons in the time period of Christ that relates and contributes to the correct understanding of the judgment is that it's progressive. And, and I mentioned it, and I didn't make the point well, but I pointed to uh, when Christ was in the temple when he was 12 years old. And uh, when they decided that it was expedient for one to die to save the whole nation, and then the cross. There was steps along the way um, in that history that were identifying that the probation was closing for Israel. So for me, did probation close for Israel when they crucified their Messiah? Well, no, but I mean, the, you don't do, do much more of a bold state, step than that, than close your probation. And, but we know by, prophetically it was AD 34. There was a progression uh, the stoning of Stephen, there was a progression of the close of probation. That, that's what's being illustrated there as much as anything else. So then you come, you're confronted with, okay, Pentecost, and uh, AD 34, the gospel's going to the Gentiles. So what I would say to that is this. In, in this, in the study that we do called The Judgment of the Living, this is another theme that we do deal with. This isn't like it's a new thought. The Sunday Law is the tool that the Lord uses to bring judgment to a close. It is progressive. It begins with the dead, goes to the living. It begins with the, God's church, then to God's children outside of his church. But it's also progressive geographically. So, the Sunday Law in the United States, probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists in the United States. And that's a point that I believe and I always make. And I, will, and I did here already. It may close a little bit later in England or a little bit later in Switzerland or these other countries. It's progressive. So we do see in the Sunday Law story that there is, starting at the Sunday Law, Latin rain beginning, but the, the close of probation um, for the Jews, for modern Israel, there's still a progression because until that last country brings the crisis to God's people in that country, then there technically is still uh, room, probation open for some of modern Israel and that last country, wh wherever it is. The difficulty with that symbol is that we know that in the United States, at that time, the latter rains poured out and God's other children in Babylon begin coming out and standing with God's people. So simultaneously, there is, at this time period, the loud cry is starting the final warning message, which is come out of Babylon, and that begins right then and there in the United States. It spreads progressively. So I, my answer to your question is, is that I think that the history of Christ is illustrating the close of probation in a progressive fashion, and that you, that you can even illustrate um, the progression of Israel's close of probation on up to 34 with that, and still begin to sh see it as an illustration of the latter rain going to the gospel, because, going to the Gentiles, because it does begin there in the United States as well at the Sunday Law. So I, but 
Now, um, over here, you have a map of the United Nations, and uh, that, for a long time, we used to sell the book where, you will find, where we got that map from. It's a book by Gary Kaw. It's called En Route to Global Occupation. One of the things that makes that book authoritative is that Gary Kaw was an ambassador for the United States government, and in, this, in the book he tells you that he didn't believe in the New World Order, but as he began to travel as an ambassador for the United States, he kept running into it and began gathering information. And when you get to probably the last tenth of the book is just the documentation, different um, laws from the United Nations and from the United States government. I mean, it's really a well-documented book, but it also gives a very concise history of masonry from way back in the Knights of the Templar all the way to, to the modern day um, United Nations. And in his book, he has this map from the United Nations. And uh, so I know that in the Protestant world, and Gary Kaw is a Protestant, that there is a lot of things that are taught that when you check their documentation, it's weak to say the least. So someone gave me a letter from the United Nations. And this is the question that was sent to the United Nations about this map. It says, has the United Nations divided the world into 10 divisions? And if so, in what context and for what purpose? Thank you. And then this is the response from the United Nations. I apologize for this late reply. I am not aware of such divisions. It would help if you could tell us where you got the information. We regret that we could not help you at this time. Thank you for writing to the United Nations. So there is the possibility that Gary Kaw made all this up and it doesn't exist. I would, I would suggest that his book was written in the early 80s probably. So who's ever the public relations person at the United Nations today may not know what went on 20 years ago, but I, I, really, I really don't know what to tell you. I'm just being open and honest. For me, that's very good information in connection with Revelation 17, but you don't need that map. You don't need that map. I, I'm, uh, Bible prophecy is identifying uh, the Ten Kings as a, the, as Sister White says when she refers to the Ten Kings, let me read it to you. Um, these have what she quotes Revelation 13 and 14, which is 17, verses 13 and 14. I'll start with verse 12, so we know that we're talking about the ten horns. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Whenever John received this, these ten kings' single kingdom was still in the future, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Now, now here's verse 13. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Sister White quotes verses 13 and 14, and she says this. These have one mind. There will be a universal bond of union. And I'm certain of this, that if we grab a dictionary, universal doesn't mean Europe. It means worldwide. These ten kings are representing a political authority that encompasses the entire world. And whether the United Nations has truly divided it up into ten kingdoms or not, Bible prophecy says that it is so. So anyway, just to keep abreast on what's going on, now let's move into the study of Daniel 11. For me, Daniel 11, this is my favorite. I don't know um, about some of you here. <clears throat> Education, page 191. The Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. The student should learn to view the Word as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme, of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy, and of the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy, and he should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. Very good quote, very important quote in my mind that we should learn, among other things, to trace the working of these powers that are struggling for ascendancy through the records of history and prophecy. This is part of our responsibility of students of prophecy and we should put it in the context of the great controversy. The history and the 
prophetic history of the great controversy is what we should learn to do from the Bible as students of prophecy. So in terms of the great controversy, if you turn to Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9, we find Michael, which means something close to who is like God. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, this is verse 7, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against, fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was there a place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. For me, uh, the different titles that are put on Christ throughout Scripture are used by Christ to portray an aspect of his character or of his existence, his being, um, to teach us something about the place where he's located in that particular passage of Scripture. And when we find Michael in the Bible, uh, we always find Michael in conflict with Satan. Uh, this, this tells me that Michael is one of the terms, one of the titles for Christ uh, that needs to be connected with the great controversy. And of course, here in Revelation 12, we're seeing where the great controversy begins. It begins in heaven, and it's the war between Christ and Satan. And this war is also categorized under the, the meaning of Michael. Who is like unto God? It's the struggle about who's going to be God. Satan wants to ascend the throne and take the seat of Christ, take the seat of the Heavenly Father. The, the, the idea of who Michael is and what he's struggling about, uh, it, one of the conversations we had earlier, taking it to the lower level, this is a good quote to put the, con the struggle of the great controversy into the correct context. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 973. Cast out of heaven, Satan set up his kingdom in this world, and ever since he has been untiringly striving to seduce human beings from their allegiance to God. He uses the same power that he used in heaven, the influence of mind upon mind. This great controversy has to do with the internal aspects of prophecy. But when we see Christ portrayed in prophecy as Michael, what it's telling us, one of the things it's telling us, is this is the great controversy. This is the struggle between Christ and Satan. And in Revelation 12, we see where it began. Daniel's last vision, we see where it ends. But in Jude, it says this, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which not, kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, here he is, he is once again in a battle with the devil, the great controversy, only this time it's down on earth. When, when Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Here we're seeing another aspect of the great controversy brought down to planet earth. And for me, this is uh, Satan challenging uh, the authority that Christ has to be the judge. Christ has the authority to judge who is worthy of resurrection and eternal life and who isn't worthy of resurrection and eternal life. And here we see his adversary raising this argument. The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 342. And I would submit that the question of Christ being the judge is part of the argument in the Great Controversy. But in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 342, Sister White comments on this. As Christ and the angels approached the grave, Satan and his angels appeared at the grave and were guarding the body of Moses, lest it should be removed. As Christ and his angels drew nigh, Satan resisted their approach, but was compelled by the glory and power of Christ and his angels to fall back. 
Satan claimed the body of Moses because of his one transgression, but Christ meekly referred him to his father, saying, The Lord rebuke thee. Christ told Satan that he knew Moses had humbly repented of this wrong. He was the judge. He knew that sin had been confessed and repented of. Repented of this one wrong, that no stain rested upon his character, and that his name in the heavenly book of records stood untarnished. Then Christ resurrected the body of Moses, which Satan had claimed. Part of the argument is the argument of whether Christ has the authority to judge. Great Controversy, 484, 485. While Jesus is pleading for the subjects of his grace, Satan accuses them before God as transgressors. And to the accuser of his people he declares, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Zechariah 3, 2. Christ will clothe his faithful ones with his own righteousness, that he may present them to his Father, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Christ um, has the authority to determine who's saved or lost. So, that's two places in the Word of God where we see Michael, and in both places he's in controversy with Satan. Uh, the third place that we find Michael in the Word of God, and the final place, is in Daniel's last vision. And I emphasize Daniel's last vision because typically in Adventism, most Adventists, if they're given an opportunity to go out into a non-Adventist and give a Bible study on Daniel 2, it's no problem. Daniel 7 is pretty easy. Daniel 8, a little bit harder. Because if you're going to do Daniel 8 right, you've got to do the sanctuary at least a little bit, and perhaps you can avoid the daily. So Daniel 8 is a little bit harder than Daniel 7. Daniel 2 is pretty easy, but if you have to go out and give a Bible study on Daniel 11, I ask this question all the time. How many of you are prepared to go out and give a Bible study on Daniel 11 to a non-Adventist today? Now, in this classroom, probably every hand goes up, but typically when you ask that question, virtually no hands go up. And there's a reason for this. This, this chapter, this last vision, it's not a chapter, has purposely, Satan has purposely tried to bury the understanding of this last vision of Daniel. And uh, so, I say Daniel's last vision for this reason. We're so unfamiliar with Dan Daniel's last vision that some of us in Adventism think that Daniel 10 and Daniel 11 and Daniel 12 are three different visions or three different parts. But the reality of it is, Daniel's last vision is chapters 10 through 12 and it must be considered as such. And there's a lot of people that don't do it that way. And some of the fanaticism in Adventism today is because people won't do that. Uh, the people that want to reapply time prophecy at the end of the world, almost all of them will take Daniel 12, they'll take the daily in Daniel 12, and they'll use that daily in Daniel 12 as a starting point for a time prophecy at the end of the world. And they invent some idea of what that daily symbolizes. But... To be correct to Daniel's last vision, whatever you say that daily represents in Daniel 12, it has to be the same daily as in Daniel 11:31, because they're the same vision. There is no literary justification for making the, the daily uh, in Daniel 11 different than the daily in Daniel 12. So, I mean, there are definitely people in Adventism that break apart Daniel's last vision. And Daniel's last vision is chapters 10 through 12. And this is where we also find the story of Michael. Um, in Daniel 10, let's start with Daniel 10. This will be hard. There's a lot of stuff to, that you can get drawn aside on here, and I've got to keep focused. But let's start in verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. Let me ask you a question. It's not on subject here, but I want to put it in our mind early on. What's repeated in this verse? There's one thing repeated. And what does it mean when the Lord repeats something? Important. It's important. The thing that's repeated in verse 1 is that Daniel understood the thing and he had understanding of the vision. For some reason, the first thing, the very first thing that we're told about Daniel's last vision, what God, one of the things God wants us to remember is that 
when you're dealing with Daniel's last vision, please put it in your mind that Daniel, however he relates to that last vision, he understood it. He understood it. He had understanding of the vision. He had understanding of the thing. Twice mentioned, twice emphasized, twice emphasized but reading on. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittical, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body was his body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like unto the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and I saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet, I, yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground, and behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hand. And he said unto me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto you, and stand upright, for unto thee I am sent now. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come forth for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Notice the dignitaries of Persia. What's, who's the dignitaries of Persia? No. There's a prince and a king. Notice that those aren't the same entities. There's a king and a prince. There's a struggle going on with the king of Persia and the prince of Persia is involved. And, and the prince, Prince Michael, the chief prince, um, this word prince, as you see on the screen, Tsar, translated prince, occurs 420 times in the Old Testament. It refers especially to military commanders. The prince of Persia struggling against Michael, the great prince. Uh, the word prince is telling us in agreement with the other places where we find Michael. It's warfare. The, this vision is set in the context of a, a, a struggle going on between Michael and the prince of Persia, these two military commanders. And uh, in verse 13, the prince or Tsar of the kingdom of Persia is different than the king of Persia. It's different than the king of Persia. In verses 20 and 21, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now I will return and fight with the prince, the Tsar of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince Tsar of Grecia shall come. Grecia, Grecia. But I will show, you, show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me, but Michael your prince, Daniel 10, 12 through 13 quoted, uh, which we just read. By this we see that heavenly agencies have to contend with hindrances before the purpose of God is fulfilled in its time. The king of Persia, the, the actual king of Persia, was controlled by the highest of all evil angels. Who's the highest of all evil angels? Satan. Satan. What's being described here is the warfare between Christ and Satan. And then, of course, um, when we get to Daniel 12, 1, we see Michael stand up, which we have read um, more than once already. Uh, so we're seeing this warfare. And uh, what I wanted to suggest there, um, the very beginning of verse 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up. At what time? The... the the structure of the verse points us back into the previous verses. Somewhere in the previous verses that were just discussed. See, it's, it's one vision. Daniel 10, 11, and 12 are the same vision. Somewhere in the verses that lead up to verse 1 of Daniel 12, Michael stands up. And it, these are the verses where 
he obviously stands up, verses 44, 45. In this quote, um, which is Great Controversy 613, 614, Sister White quotes Daniel 12, 1, and she says this, When the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. I believe we have already read this quote, so we've saved ourselves some time. It is clear that when Michael stands up in verse 1 of Daniel 12, that human probation closes. So what we're seeing here in Daniel's last vision is that the Daniel's praying, fasting for three weeks, and uh, when light begins to be given to him about the situation, the first piece of information that is conveyed to him is the struggle between the prince of Persia, which I submit to you is none other than Satan, and that Michael, our prince. Once again, we have the great controversy portrayed um, by the use of the name Michael. Um, Jesus, the author of all the prophecies, Jesus, the voice of all the prophets, is saying to us that when it comes to Daniel's last vision, we must understand it in the context of the great controversy. Uh, a great, the great controversy that began in heaven, that was brought down to earth, the great controversy that has to do with the argument about who has the authority to be the judge, the argument against Christ. And here, the setting is in the, when you look at Daniel 11, is in the truth that Jesus has the authority to control the providence of history according to his will, even though Satan fights him every step of the way, Jesus is there in that controversy prevailing and making sure that his providence comes to pass. Now, we're, going to, we're just about ready to jump into another um, point that we need to develop before we get into the last six verses of Daniel 11, but please back up with me if you would. We read the first verses of Daniel 10, and in Daniel chapter 10... Uh, where do I want to cut it off with? Let, let's cut it off verses 1 through 9. In verse 1, Daniel's told, he receives this vision, he understands the thing, he understands the vision. Verse 2, he tells us that he's mourning three full weeks, ate no pleasant bread, he's in a fast. Is that how you understand verses 2 and 3? Daniel's fasting during this time period. And then on the 4 and 20th day, he receives the vision. And who is the vision? Well, the vision that he sees, who is this? This is Christ. This is Christ. In verse uh, 5, 6, 7. In verse 7, he points out that when he seen the vision, there was men with him. But there was a great quaking, and they fled. And uh, verse 8, he talks about his condition after this vision. And I submit to you, how many of you have read Daniel's last vision, chapter 10 through 12? Every hand goes up, amen. That's the way it should be. What does this have to do with the, the history of the world? What's these first nine verses have to do with the struggle between Christ and Satan in controlling the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and the Papal Romans? What's it got to do with it? Why, why, did, why did we need to see... Uh, why do we need to know that Daniel was fasting for three weeks? I mean, you know, it's interesting to see that at the end of his prayers and the end of his fast, then help comes three weeks later. That's interesting. But, but what's the significance? What is Jesus trying to teach us in all this? All these things happened as an example. So what kind of example is being set here? And brothers and sisters, we're going to deal with this towards the end of our studies, but we read it here. I want to suggest this to you. That in Daniel's last vision, we see the beginning of Adventism and the end of Adventism illustrated. Prophets are used to illustrate God's people at the end of the world. Everyone knows that, even if you've never thought about that. In Revelation chapter 10, when John takes the little book and he eats it and it's sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach, what's, what's John doing? He's illustrating God's people at the end of the world. And I'd submit to you that in Daniel's last vision, God's people at the end of the world are both portrayed, both 
the beginning and the end of Adventism. Let me show you where I think the, end, the beginning of Adventism is portrayed. Remember verse 1. What did we say about verse 1? What's the one thing that it's emphasized in verse 1 is that Daniel understood this vision. And brothers and sisters, how many of you think that Daniel 10, 11, and 12 are not? How many of you think that those three chapters are not the same vision? We all agree it's the same vision. The first thing we're told is Daniel understood the vision. Go to Daniel chapter 12. Verse 6. Russell read these verses earlier today. We don't have to go all the way back up. Verse 6. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of his holy people, all these things shall be finished. This time prophecy here, this time, times and a half, what is that? 1260 years. Was the power of this holy people scattered during the 1260 years? Where can you show that? Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3. Same time prophecy, the scattering of the holy people. This is the 1260 years of the Dark Ages that are, it's, in vision, it's set before Daniel, and then let's read the next verse. And I heard, but I understood not. What? Does God's word contradict itself? No. We're told at the very beginning of the vision, and it's emphasized that Daniel understood the vision, he understood the thing, but in the same vision, he hears the 1260-year prophecy, and he says he heard, but he understood not. It says, and I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Well, Daniel, I thought you knew. Verse 1 says you knew. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a contradiction in God's word. Or, or, Daniel is doing what prophets do many times in Scripture. He's being used by Christ to illustrate God's people at the end of the world. And I would submit to you that here, in this passage, Daniel is symbolizing the pioneer time period of people that came across the time prophecies in the book of Daniel. They had a burden to understand them. They didn't understand them, but they wanted to understand them. And there was an increase of knowledge where they did understand them. And they took that message to the world. In this part of Daniel's last vision, Daniel is symbolizing the Millerite movement. But, back here in chapter 10, Daniel's symbolizing the other side of the story. Verse 2 and 3. What's Daniel doing in verses 2 and 3? Of chapter 10. He's fasting. Do you, do you know a group of people in a time period that have been called to be mourning and fasting? Who is that? It's God's people during the Day of Atonement, right? I would submit to you that Daniel, in this, this sequence of verses, is talking about 144,000 as one tag. Let's, let's read on. Uh, in verse 4, 5, and 6, what does Daniel see? A revelation of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I submit to you that anyone that's among the 144,000 will be required, will definitely possess a genuine experience with Jesus Christ. There isn't anyone that's going to be among the 144,000 that hasn't had their own personal confrontation with Jesus Christ. Paul did. The Apostle Paul said the gospel is a revelation. The gospel is a revelation. That's what Daniel is symbolizing here. Is the people at the end of the world that during the fasting morning time period, during the Day of Atonement, that also have the personal righteousness of Jesus Christ within their experience. But there were others with Daniel, wasn't there? What's the next verse? Seven? And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for the men that were with me saw not the vision. 
Daniel is also at the end of the world symbolizing these people. He's symbolizing as one that develops this experience of the 144,000 in a group of people. And what did that group of people not do? They didn't see the vision. But what happened to them? A quaking came upon them and they fled. Quaking is awful close to shaking. They got shaken out, brothers and sisters. So, what other characteristic of God's end time people is here in the beginning of Daniel's last vision? What other characteristic? This is the one we want to start with in our study. What other characteristic have we mentioned here? If Daniel is truly representing God's people at the end of the world here in the opening part of chapter 10, what other characteristic have you seen? It's this. The 144,000 they're going to understand Daniel 11. They're going to understand Daniel's last vision. That's going to be one of their characteristics is that they're going to have a confrontation with the information in Daniel's last vision. That's the increase of knowledge for them at the end. The increase of knowledge for the Millerites was on the time prophecies. If you doubt it, just look at the pioneer charts. That was their message, the time prophecies from the book of Daniel. Our message is different. Our message is the last vision of Daniel, chapters 10 through 12. And more specifically, if we want to get specific, it's the last six verses of Daniel 11. They're going to understand that message. They're going to have a personal experience with Jesus Christ, and they will have entered into the most holy place experience by faith and entered into the work of purification and putting away of sin, which is our responsibility in this time period. That's what's symbolized here at the beginning of Daniel 11, from my understanding. Now, Great Controversy 613, where Sister White is speaking about probation closing when Michael stands up. If we drop down to the last part of this, uh, let's, right after the uh, yellow text where it says every case has been decided for life or death Christ has made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins the number of his subject is made up the kingdom and dominion the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is about to be given to the heirs of salvation and Jesus is to reign as king of kings and lord of lords one of the truths that is portrayed in Daniel's last vision is that Satan and the papacy are going to counterfeit Christ and Christ is the king of kings with a capital K but Nebuchadnezzar and the papacy is going to impersonate, personate Christ, try to take his place. And uh, they, are, they are a king of king, little king. I have a couple more quotes before we get there. I'm jumping ahead. Uh, Daniel 10, 14. Uh, now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. The, the context of Daniel's last vision is that this is the vision that lets us know what happens to God's people in the latter days. If there's a, a point in Scripture that we should understand, it's this vision because the, 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 this vision is put in the context. Is this is the information that lets us know what takes place in the latter days. And brothers and sisters, we've already looked at this quote from Selected Messages, book 1. Page 121, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. And we've looked at this next quote, seven pages later. A revival means resurrection from spiritual death. And we've looked at this next quote when we understand the books of Daniel and Revelation. There'll be seen a great revival. There's something in the book of Daniel that brings about a revival. In the Great Controversy 594, we've read this quote. We've did a lot of groundwork. We've did a lot of groundwork for this study, so we can move very quickly. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. Prophecies twofold. It tells us the events connected with the close of probation. When's probation close? In the vision that we're studying, when does probation close? When Michael stands up, human probation closes. And what are the events connected with Michael standing up? It's those events in the verses before Daniel 12.1. That's where they are. The events connected with the close of probation have been clearly revealed, but multitudes have no understanding of these important truths. Nor do they have an understanding of the need of preparation. 
But when you rightly understand those events and you realize that probation is about to close, you also understand at the same time you need to prepare. This, this, we're entering into the greatest time of trouble there's ever been since there's been a nation. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 102. The scenes connected with the working of the man of sin are the last features plainly revealed in this earth's history. When it comes to end time Bible prophecy, the, the scenes that are most clearly revealed have to do with the man of sin, the papacy. That's a good point of reference because we're going to have to define who the king of the north is. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 106, 107, brothers and sisters, from my perspective, Russell's been quoting this both mornings, this passage. This is one of the most important quotes for a correct understanding of Daniel 11 that, that I've come across in the writings of Ellen White. I'll just take the last part of the first paragraph, begin there, where it says the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is now unsealed, and the revelation made by Christ is to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth. By the increase of knowledge, a people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. It's just a few paragraphs later. Uh, it's not a new uh, thought on her. It's the same passage. She tells us what the increase of knowledge will be that prepares God's people to stand in the latter days. I'm not trying to... Uh, I'm not trying to cause... <laughs> any problems here. But she, it, it, I'm not trying to downplay any of the truth that we need to uphold and experience. But she doesn't tell us that the increase of knowledge is on country living, nor does she say it's on the health message, nor does she say it's on the nature of Christ. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to cause any shakings. I just want to emphasize what she does say the increase of knowledge that prepares God's people to stand in the latter days is, because she's very specific. She says, in the first angel's message, men are called upon to worship God, our creator, who made the world and all things that are therein. They've paid homage to an institution of the papacy, making of no effect the law of Jehovah. But there is to be an increase of knowledge on this subject. And brothers and sisters, very simply, the increase of knowledge is about the papacy and the Sunday law. And the increase of knowledge tells us probation is about to close. And when we understand that truth from God's word, then country living, the health message, the correct understanding and the genuine experience of righteousness by faith, it becomes something that we must possess. And the nature of Christ. The nature of Christ. Oh, I, I didn't try to hit them all. I didn't try to hit them all. There is much light in Adventism. But the point of reference and inspiration, the, the point of reference that God points to, that He uses to prepare God's people to stand, to bring the revival, to bring them back to life, is an increase of knowledge about the papacy in the Sunday Law. So, we read this quote already, and, and I emphasized it four or five quotes earlier. Jesus is the King of Kings. But in Daniel 2.37, when Daniel's speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, Thou, O king, are a king of kings, little k, little k. And Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, is certainly a type of modern Babylon. And one of the things that uh, we know about the papacy the modern Babylon, is that it is the Antichrist. And what does anti mean? Usually in, in, in our terminology today it means against. But the biblical anti means in place of or instead of. Antichrist. This, the papacy is the one that is, stands in the place of Christ. And it's a little king of kings. It, Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the papacy. He's also, in the fact that he's identified as a king of kings, it's identifying the the Babylon papal role in trying to stand as Christ on earth. The O king are a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Notice uh, that this king of kings um, comes from the north. But let's read Prophets and Kings 5.14. Exalted to the pinnacle of worldly honor and acknowledged even by inspiration as a king of kings... Ezekiel 26, 7, speaking, um, 
th about the same king. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring Tyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north, with horses and ch with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. Uh, Babylon is a king of kings. It comes from the north. Who's the one from the north in the Bible? Uh, we've read uh, in one of our earlier presentations where we were dealing with Christ being the first and the last. We read from Isaiah 41 and some other passages in Isaiah um, that followed chapter 41 that Christ is the righteous man from the east. He's the one that comes from the north and from the rising of the sun. We have these verses here. Who raised up the righteous man from the east? Who hath wrought and done it? calling the generations from the beginning, I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come from the rising of the sun. I will give to Jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings. In our earlier presentation, we had the discussion trying to figure out who this was. Some said Cyrus, some said God's people, some said Christ, and we said they're all correct. But in the Bible, Christ is the one that comes from the north. He's the one that comes from the east. And when we see Babylon coming from the north, it's bringing part of the biblical truth of Babylon's role to try to stand in the place of Christ. He stands in the place of Christ as a king of kings, as the king of the north. And he comes from Babylon. In uh, Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2, it says, A song and psalm for the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful first situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And then in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, which we read earlier today, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, Notice, please, that one of the things that Satan does is he ascends. You see this ascension with both Satan and papacy in the scriptures. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan is trying to personate Christ. And Christ is the king of kings with the capital K that is the king that comes from the north. And Satan is attempting to personate him and he does it through his earthly representative which is Babylon, a king of kings, small k, that comes from the north. Signs of the Times, November 19th, 1894. Through the Pope of Rome, the same work has been carried on here on earth as was carried on in the courts of heaven before the expulsion of the prince of darkness. Satan sought to correct the law of God in heaven and to supply an amendment of his own. He exalted his own judgment above that of his creator and placed his will above the will of Jehovah and in this way virtually declared God to be fallible. The Pope also takes the same course and claiming infallibility for himself seeks to adjust the law of God to meet his own ideas thinking himself able to correct the mistakes he thinks he sees in statutes and commands of the Lord of heaven and earth, he virtually says to the world, I will give you better laws than those of Jehovah. What an insult is this to the God of heaven. Satan, the papacy, very closely related Bible symbols. They're, the papacy is used by Satan to accomplish the purposes of and design of Christ. We've read this probably a couple times. Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours so that their prophesying is in force. The king that opposes Christ and his people at the end of the world in scripture has been portrayed as a king that comes from the north. Uh, he's the king of Babylon. Um, he's the king of kings, thus implying that he is the one that attempts to personate or stand in place of Christ. Micah confirms this, and it's upon the testimony of two or three of things shall be confirmed. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide, for now he shall, shall he be great unto the ends of the earth, and this man shall be the peace when the Syrian shall come into our land. And we already discussed a little bit about the Assyrian in Isaiah. If you're going to place Micah's testimony at the end of the world, then you have the responsibility of a student of prophecy to determine who Assyria is symbolizing 
And Assyria and Babylon are very closely related, but if it's going to take place at the end of the world, Assyria is a type of Babylon. Moving on, and when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men, and they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod. Notice the connection between Nimrod and Assyria. Who's Nimrod? The great, the great hunter, but the founder of what? Babylon. Here's Assyria is Babylon, and the entrances thereof. And thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land, when he treadeth our borders. From the north country, this is Jeremiah's testimony, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. The enemy at the end of time that Bible prophecy portrays is the enemy that comes from the north. The, test, the prophets testify of this. Joel, here's another testimony. I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into the land. Now, no, this is a good one. This is a good one. I like this one. Joel 2, 20. This is speaking about the end of the world because the ancient prophets were speaking about the end of the world, correct? And this is the enemy of God at the end of the world is what Joel's portraying here. He says, but I will remove far off from you the northern army. So this is the northern enemy, the king of the north. Ties right in with the king of the north that comes to his end in Daniel 11, 40, 45. And where does the king of the north come to his end in Daniel eleven forty five? It comes to his end between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Notice what Joel says. I will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face towards the east sea and his hinder part towards the utmost sea. What's that? If your face is facing this sea and another sea is behind you, where are you? You're between the seas. <laughs> That's Daniel 11.45. This is another testimony to who this is and where he goes down. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he doeth great things. Jeremiah 25, 9, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. The prophets all give this testimony. And so does John the Revelator. And John the Revelator is where all the books of the Bible meet therein. This is the point of reference for end-time Bible prophecy. And Sister White commenting on Revelation 17 in Great Controversy 382 says, The woman, Babylon, of Revelation 17, is described as, and then she quotes verses 4 through 6 and 18, and says, the power that for so many centuries maintained despotic sway over the monarchs of Christendom is Rome. Rome is the woman of Revelation 17. This is modern Babylon. This is the king of the north. This is the king of the kings. King of kings, little k. Ezekiel 39, 1 through 5. Ezekiel You'll see highlighted with God, the story of Gog and Magog. Um, they come from the north parts. They were all speaking about the end of the world. Um, Isaiah, same testimony. There's a smoke that comes from the north. The king of the north is God's enemy at the end of the world. Isaiah 14, 31 through 32. According to the prophets, and upon the testimony of two or three things shall be established, I knew I was running out of time. Okay. Um, I got, I, uh, we're going to have to start here, even at the next one. What I want to say here, I wanted to get to the end and then try to draw it together. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that we need to challenge people with when we deal with Daniel's last vision is the fact that we're supposed to teach Bible prophecy in the context of the great controversy. And one of the clues in Bible prophecy that you see that identifies the great controversy is Michael. When you see Michael, you see him in Conf conflict with Satan. And right here in Daniel's last vision, we see Michael in conflict with Satan. And in terms of the great controversy, there are several climaxes to the great controversy that we can point to. So I'm not saying this is the only one. But where the climax of the great controversy reaches its height in the sense of human probation still being open is in Daniel 11, 45. 44, 45, because Daniel 12, 1, when Michael stands up, human probation closes, and Daniel 12, 1 says, and at that time, somewhere in verses 44 and 45, human probation comes to a conclusion, and in, in terms of the great controversy, this is an important event. So, when it comes to Daniel's last vision, it contains in it the events that lead 
to perhaps the most important event in the great controversy. I'm, I'm not trying to deny the cross, I'm, but I mean, it's, we, have to, we have to understand the significance uh, in the terms of the great controversy what, of what's taking place when human probation is finally closed. There are other climaxes too, but this is one of the most supreme. So my question is, is this a passage of scripture that we should understand? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. These, these verses are not verses that, that more than once. <laughs> I, recently in Europe, I had a pastor introduce this message the first night in a different language, so I didn't know he was doing it. And he told the congregation something like this. He says, I want you to know that this brother's uh, uh, message may be interesting, but remember, it's just his own understanding. It's just his own interpretation. Brothers and sisters, we have no right to do that. We have to hear what someone says and compare it with God's word. And if it's true, we have to receive it. And that type of attitude to think that we can take this passage of scripture and choose this opinion of it, or that opinion of it, or that opinion of it, is fatal. But it's not even justified by the context of the scripture because this is one of the most important events in the great controversy. And we'll have to take this up um, in our next presentation. Shall we have a word of prayer? And <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for being the one that has walked from the beginning to the end of the great controversy and provided opportunity that we can play a part in it. Help us to understand where we are in the flow of events and have us um, do what it takes to obtain the information that we can clearly portray where we are in this flow of events to those around us. And let these events drive us to the foot of the cross that we can um, surrender every idol that may be preventing us from having um, a full and complete experience with you. Lord, we don't want to just understand these things. We want these things to be a part of us through the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we know that he's only going to abide with us if every sin, every idol is removed. We ask that you do what it takes in each of our lives to make that happen. And we ask that you would give us the courage to uh, understand these things and then Take them to the enemy and tear down those strongholds and finish this work that we might go home with you soon. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>